uh, judicial system, uh, Kampong Medang murders. Not investigated in spite of repeated attempts to get the attention of the courts. Okay? And uh, there are many cases where now people entangled between their religion and Islam, you know, are, uh, you know, because they're non Muslims, they uh, appeal to the civil courts, but the civil courts, you know, advocating their responsibility and handing over to the Sharia courts. In that sense, the Sharia courts are actually, in, in, in the constitution, Sharia courts are uh, inferior courts. The superior courts basically should adjudicate on these matters for the non Muslims, but in, increasingly the inferior courts are encroaching into the area of the civil and superior courts. Yeah. By the media, we don't have to say this, we don't have to say, you know, much, we, you know, I'm just making this one point, the Malay proverb, the media is given free hand to speak for the racist policies of the government. In the education system again, you know, I mean, we know this, we know this, okay? As I said, two education systems, two education systems, right? Underfunded primary schools for non malays SPM pre-university exams, private universities for most of them, small number in public universities, limited scholarship support. So what this says is, you go find your education on your own. That's what this says, if you look at all of that. Right? Underfunded, go get the funds, if you can. Right? On the other side, we have Pramata Kindis, well-funded SRK primary school, MRSN, matriculation pre-university programs, overseas university prep programs, Mara University, other public universities, scholarship support. This is the truth. Maybe a little bit, you know, uh, you know, sensitive for me to say, but it is the truth. Okay, and uh, this is a rare occasion when we get some statistics, 2011. This is the uh, student population distribution, ethnic distribution, right? I just, sorry, I just want to point out, you know, the uh, minority representation, right? I, for my part, want to just, you know, take this, Indians, 2.57%, right? I mean, we can say the same for every one of the other categories, but I take this. We have overseas students, 5.4%. Who are these overseas students? I guess, you know, where big business goes abroad and needs to, uh, you know, to uh, do corporate citizenship in those countries, probably, you know, for that purpose of the elite, right? But the people of this country, you know, if, if we go by quota systems, 22,000 Indians should have got places in the universities. Let's say they get, uh, it costs 100,000 uh, piece for a degree, right? That's 22 billion a year that has to be forked out by Indian parents who are already in impoverished states. State. Okay. okay. So basically, as a result, I, I cannot postulate, as a result of this institutionalized racism, one of the effects has been entrapping, okay, and abandoning the Indian poor in a in poverty, in a trap of poverty, right? Resulting in disposition and marginalization. Okay? Now, had there not been institutionalized racism, I postulate again, right? There would have been good foundational education for the young Indian children. Program movement on the estates for the displaced workers. Adequate opportunities provided in the agricultural sector. Adequate training in post secondary school education opportunities apart to adjust to the new social and physical environment. All this did not happen. The path for crime would not have been the sole path for upward mobility for many of the Indian young. There would have been a path to move out from illiteracy, semi-illiteracy, where there's a lot, ignorance and vulnerability to productive and robust roles in society. Not wasted languishing in prisons or in peddling drugs. Effectively, the Indian poor will join the mainstream and lead a life of dignity and of hope and contribute positively to the realization of a greater nation. But that is not to be. Racism denies equality, and whenever equality is denied, everything else goes with it. There is no dignity where there is no 
equality. Okay, so put all of that together, we join the dots. Okay? First, we have an ethnocentric political system, which is 50% plus one, and you get to rule the country. Okay? And that result has resulted in 54 years of uninterrupted UMNO rule. Okay? And uh, couple that with the two key of citizenship and trends in the federal constitution, Article 153. A key factor that provided the vehicle to usurp the national agenda. UMNO developed its Katuanan Melayu doctrine and all the other structures. Other communities remain from that time. Okay? And entrenches racism. In the 54 years, we have an EP, employment almost completely excludes normalities in the you know, uh, those sectors. Decision making in the administration is right in the hands of the elite. This end kept in check by the prisons, the laws, the attorneys general, the judges, and threats from politicians. And Islamism allowed to develop to emphasize the malayness of the elite's constituency needed for the self preservation of the elite. Increasing erosion, resulting in increasing erosion of religious rights of minority and entrenching. Racism, usurpation of the national resource, and marginalization of minorities. Okay, this is what I was, you know, ready to get to. Uh, National Feedlot Center. You see how this whole thing comes together in this example. I'm not so concerned about the scandal, about them not making money or them losing money. It's more the, in, the, the instance itself. This is one instance we get to see, but there's only one instance we get to see. This is the tip of the iceberg, okay? Now, let me just go through it. Okay, EPU and Prime Minister. This was a high impact project, by the way. Only a, a Prime Minister decides, right? I guess with the Economic Planning Unit, right? And that the Dr. Mohammed Sali Ismail, who heads the company, was formerly head of the Technology Park, right? And who incidentally only happens to be the husband of the minister. Coincidence. Yeah, just pure coincidence. Okay? Okay. So I wonder what they talk about, okay? And then uh, he says, he flatly says, no, they don't talk about these things. Okay. And then the uh, uh, interesting thing, there was, a, there was an interview, and in the interview, the, uh, 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 Dr. Mohamed Saleh Ismail says, you know, my children were studying in the United States, and they were working there, and I had to convince them to come back and take up these positions because the, the, the country has given you the your opportunity now come back and pay back. What opportunity is he talking about? <laughs> so what opportunity? He, the scholarships that went that took them to the American universities. I would guess. Yes, yes. yes. I, I don't know this for a fact, but I would think so. I can give in writing. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I don't need it in writing. Okay. All right. So and then at the time that this was uh, at the time that this was approved, Mohini Yasin was the agricultural minister, right? And he was vice president of AMNO, vying to become the deputy president of AMNO. And uh, Charizard, you know, was Manita ahead. And guess what? You know, I scratch your back, you scratch my back. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, uh, okay, Bank Portania, I don't know this for a fact again, but I made sure because there was some meeting with Bank Portania. So Bank Portania is probably the financier for the 250 million in soft loans. Right, two percent. I understand, uh, of which I think they bought uh, two hundred million for I don't know how many billion, and the uh, return is twelve percent. Good business, right? Right. Right. And they were granted five thousand acres of land for the project. Now here, yeah. for for fifty four years, Tamil schools have been asking. Now we have 500 schools, 370 schools, which are not on land, which belongs to them. We've been asking, five acres for these schools, 1,500 or 2,000 acres, right? And here, so easily they're helping themselves, you know, to the resource of the nation, so easily. And denying, I say, the minorities of what is rightfully theirs, right? So, Official Secrets Act kept much of, much of this story opaque until it came out as it did. Right? Otherwise, we wouldn't 
hear about it as we are not hearing about all the rest of the other stuff that's going on. Okay, the media will spin it as an opposition ploy for the elections coming up, right? And that's the role of the media. See how, how all of this comes together in our infrastructure of control. The MACC and the Attorney General will, in all likelihood, not find anything wrong with Sarita. After all, she told me that. Why? She didn't have anything to do with the project. No. Yeah, that's how it works. That's how it really works. Okay. So, in summary, institutionalized racism is a distinct feature of Malaysian life. Institutionalized racism has evolved to become an infrastructure for the usurpation of the natural resource. Institutionalized racism has marginalized a significant section of its people. Okay? So that's my case. Now, what have we been doing? Locally, this is only what we did last year, representative actions on the ground taking up human rights violation issues. Basically, if you institutionalize racism on one side of the coin, violation of minority rights is the other side of the coin. So we take that up. Okay, uh, stateless Indians. We say there are close to 400,000 Indians in the country without proper state identification documents. They are stateless, right? But the government is in denial. And then they had this My Doctor program, and after the My Doctor program, recently there was a uh, statement in the papers saying that, you know, uh, there's still some more. So what's all this? Right? So we, we take that up. Okay, this is part of, see, when we say racism, denying statehood is an aspect of racism. Because it is selective denials. Dilapidated Tamil schools, I keep saying that. Here, just as an example, here. Yeah? That's the cabin in which the school resides. In 2004 election, they went and said, we want to build you all the school. 2008 election, they went and said, we want to build you the school. 2012 election, they have gone and said, we will build you the school. I let you decide. I let you find out if they build the school. Okay. Temple demolitions, this is, uh, you know, ongoing. And uh, now, you know, uh, without proper understanding of religious practices, you know, now there's a new argument. Hey, these are not temples, these are shrines. Understanding minorities' life norms. In the, the absence of an understanding of minority life norms is another aspect of this institutional racism. Because it becomes easy to just explain something off. Besides, you have the media and then you have your mandos to do the rest of the work for you. 